All right, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to our last of the lunchtime talks in science and math for the semester. Uh, we will be starting up again in the spring and late January, so please look for those announcements. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ankur Chatterjee from our computer science program. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Well, uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is mainly on my little bit of research work, as I say. I uh, mainly come from the background of computer vision and pattern recognition. So what I mainly work with is designing algorithms for video surveillance, namely doing object tracking and detection. So today's talk is going to be based on that. Now, just before I begin, I uh, just want to tell you that there will be a number of uh, demonstrations in terms of videos for this talk. So just let me know uh, if you can see it from the back or there's any problem actually with light, uh, we'll try to adjust that. But as you understand, it's video surveillance, so it's based on videos. So there will be a number of uh, demonstrations which have been done. And just to let you know, the demonstrations are kind of based on, if you're wondering about the data sets or the videos, they're based on some security footage which I kind of gathered over the years for my research work. So let's begin the talk by talking a little bit about the overview. So I'll talk about a little bit about motivation behind uh, the kind of work I do, which is on video surveillance, as I mentioned. Uh, the common applications, uh, we are interested here to look more into intelligent surveillance. So I'll try to explain intelligent surveillance through some scenarios. Again, there will be some demonstrations uh, based on some of the things which I've seen and found interesting. Some of them I've worked on personally, and some of them are more of demonstration thoughts, which I've kind of taken off and done with existing algorithms. Um, we'll kind of try to focus more onto the things, again, given the time, I don't know how much justice I will be able to do as far as the kind of things which are involved in surveillance, you know, what goes on in designing algorithms, but at least I will try to focus on a very simplistic model which I have worked on personally over a lot of years, which is called the background subtraction. That's kind of a very simplistic model for doing detection, so I'll focus on that. And uh, with that, we'll also kind of try to analyze like what are the pros and cons of that <coughs> model and some of the applications, again, uh, demonstrated through some of the videos which I have over here. And then I will go into my more current form of research, which I'm currently work on. It's uh, multi-target tracking, which is, again, a very generic field. But I've been more uh, doing some specific areas of research into multi-target tracking, which I'll share with you all going towards the end of the talk. Again, I'll do some analysis and some applications, lots of videos to see, actually. It's going to be fun uh, as far as the talk goes. And then I'll, I'll kind of end up the talk looking at the current and the future scopes of the research, where I'm heading towards, and uh, what's actually the future in store for surveillance systems. So let's get started with talking a little bit about uh, the motivation behind surveillance. So what you actually know about surveillance is interesting. It all started with the good old-fashioned CCTVs or closed-circuit televisions, which are meant for mainly a lot of purposes, uh, mainly security if you talk about doing crime prevention at public places, malls, airports, security systems, all have these kind of source classic televisions. But what more the gist of the talk today is looking at how the closed circuit television cameras can be made more intelligent, which I work on personally, designing algorithms to add more special features to it. And as part of other purposes of uh, surveillance, traffic monitoring is also one of the typical examples of that. In fact, traffic monitoring kind of reminds us, uh, or for the matter of me, how many of you actually have got uh, traffic tickets driving around the roads, you know? Uh, one fine day you find a small ticket lying in your mailbox. <laughs> That's exactly because we have these monitorings in place. In fact, license plate recognition is one of the stuff which I don't personally work on, but it's a very important part of surveillance. So this is just a quick uh, note as to how uh, the surveillance kind of works. There are cameras all around us which kind of uh, capture the security footage. It goes on to the monitoring screens where there are uh, security agencies sitting behind and doing the monitoring. <coughs> now, a lot of times these are kind of nowadays where we are heading towards these are automated, but uh, you know that's the old-fashioned system of the years. And some quick statistics as to the worldwide revenue and where we are going with surveillance systems. It's like dollar seven billion for 2011, and it's almost doubled in terms of deployment uh, security cameras since 2005. So let's go ahead and actually have a look at uh, the first intelligent surveillance system. So what do you notice over here, and just want to make sure everyone can see it, just let me know in case you can't. Uh, the boxes over here we see, over here it's a public place monitoring going on with the intelligent surveillance system. So the boxes basically are identifying the human targets, uh, detecting and tracking them. 
So basically detection is the first stage in the process where the humans are kind of uh, picked and uh, detected in the frames and tracking is basically following them up to a trajectory. That's what detection and tracking is all about. So this is kind of a basic system where uh, public place surveillance is kind of going on and that's uh, kind of what goes behind the scenes in, in today's system. So that's an intelligent system to start up with uh, one of the scenarios. Of course, we have some other scenarios as well. So uh, uh, this is kind of uh, what uh, I, I basically do in terms of my work is that we collect all these security footages as part of the data set. So this is one of the data sets which I had for my research and kind of apply my algorithms to see. In fact, researchers all over the world actually apply their own algorithms and the way uh, the success is measured is uh, how many hits in terms of uh, you know, true positives they can actually get out of the detection and the tracking and how well they can actually project the trajectories. So that's part of uh, my job, just to give you an idea. So let's look at a different example from there. This is uh, traffic uh, surveillance, where what you can see over here is very interesting. This is a very sophisticated system where it's actually doing a vehicle detection, tracking, at the same time it's actually classifying the vehicles. So in terms of cars, bikes, if you see that's where it's actually keeping account of that. It's doing a multi-lane system, so as I said, it's a very sophisticated system. This is something which I haven't actually designed, but I've got this algorithm. It's more of a multi-lane tracker where they actually use data sets and do a bunch of uh, supervised learning. They actually uh, get some data sets based on different vehicles. The classification is based on kind of feeding the system with those data sets. And they are kind of, uh, you know, matched with uh, the given surveillance videos to uh, make the classification and detection real time as to what is a car against a bike or a bus. And the count is basically at the counter which keeps track of how many vehicles are going through the lane. So that's another example of what I mean by today's intelligent surveillance. So it's not just, just about just doing undefined track or uh, doing detection, but also trying to keep statistics and analyzing and introducing more intelligence towards your camera. That's where we are actually heading to. And also, you know, generally looking at uh, the current surveillance systems is where uh, today's surveillance systems are all about. So another uh, situation which is interesting, this is uh, more about uh, the, it's, a, it's actually a substation or a subway station which is showing out how a subject is being tracked at the same time you're doing the normal human tracking. So if you see the subject over here, that's the person in interest. So uh, here the region of interest as far as what we talk technically in terms is uh, the person here. The idea is to actually uh, focus on the person and see what actually he's up to. If there's someone who is interesting over there, uh, part of the algorithm is actually trying to get there. And what is interesting you'll find in the next frames is that the person actually leaves his baggage and hand it or abandons it and uh, the camera kind of circles around that. That's what typically intelligent security systems are all about today, given you know, the worldwide uh, global threat of terrorism. That's very important. And again, uh, it's part of an algorithm where actually it goes on the object you see, that's the abandoned baggage, which is the part of interest in the frame. So intelligent service systems is not just about just following the, the human <coughs> targets, but also kind of zeroing on, on something which is suspicious or can become in the process of the surveillance interesting like this package over here. And uh, finally, a little different scenario. This is face detection. That's something which I don't work on, but it's also very important given uh, face detection is towards biometrics. It's uh, the video which I actually applied. It's a very simple face detector. If you see, it's not perfect because uh, there are situations where the face is kind of being tracked long or identified, but not quite perfect any means. It's a very basic face detector. Mm -hmm and uh, mm -hmm. it's from the Matrix movie, as you can see over here, but that's also an application of face detection. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see, you know, uh, with all these videos, the kind of subject. So detection is one job, whereas uh, uh, sometimes the challenge kind of lies ahead is to actually how well you can track the subject of interest. <coughs> like over here, you know, Henry Reeves is probably our subject and also with uh, Lawrence mm -hmm. Fishburne, but that's kind of an idea of another scenario where face detection is another application. Uh, so the four videos which I showed you are examples just to get started with intelligence surveillance. The one which I personally am working on right now is the first one which is more about crowd analysis and you know public place tracking where we are just focusing on trying to do accurate tracking and detection of targets. So face detection is of course part of biometrics and surveillance but that's not quite my field. So it will be the case of traffic surveillance but all these are related. Uh, the model I'm going to show you later on as we move on with the talk is kind of applicable to different scenarios, so that can be expanded. So uh, let's go and actually look at uh, the basic model which goes behind the scenes. So this is the model I was talking about, which 
is focused on the stuff with, of course, it's one of the many models. It's called the background subtraction, where if you see in the video over here, it's basically talking about taking a background model which is basically based on the difference in frames. It could be successive frames, which is very simple, you know, trying to just detect the changes as happening from frame to frame. But uh, talking about the sophistication in this model, it could be actually adapted further and uh, done in a way that it can be more accurate. So if you just observe over here in the right-hand frame, that's where uh, the objects are getting segmented. So what you see as the white portions are the mass portions, which are basically the foreground, which is of interest to us as far as the motion analysis goes. So quick question over here. Uh, I'd like to put the question to the audience over here. Do you see anything uh, which doesn't quite seem right in this video? As far as the detection goes, if you see the white stage frames are supposed to be the foreground against the background. So something which doesn't seem quite right in the video, because that's going to be my next topic, is that the are there? Part of, the leaves are part of the background. But right, the right. Moving, right. Quite true. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the problems with this model. It's a very simplistic model. I chose this one it's because it's kind of simplistic to understand, but this model by no means is perfect, <coughs> as uh, seen over the points over here. It's because of the leaves which are moving, as mm -hmm. correctly pointed out by Steve. So one of the many problems with the BG analysis or the background of IST analysis is the fact that we assume a lot of things about this model. One of the problems which happens in this model is the noise elements, which can come because of things moving in the background apart from the main interest of region. So noise elements and also the fact that it takes into account a static background. That's the perfect scenario, which is not an analytic work. So there are things moving in the background, like another situation could be a water, you know, rippling water. And uh, there are actually some very interesting points. In fact, uh, what I'm going to show you next uh, is also something interesting. I'd like to invite the audience to actually identify, if you can, from this video. There's another important element which is uh, significant as far as handling in this model goes. But before that, also one of the points, which is assumption, again, a basic assumption, is that the camera is not moving. If the camera is moving, then we have other complications as well. So if you've seen this video, can you, if you look at this video very carefully, can you pick out something else which is important apart from the three elements I mentioned here? Shadow. Yeah. Yes. Good point, Steve. Thanks. Yes. It's shadow. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> one of the current scenarios which is part of ongoing research is how well can a surveillance system track shadows. Now if you notice over here, there are different shadows which are coming up. This is the background, which is, again, if you see, it's not quite static, perfectly static, but still it's identifying the humans. But as it moves on the shadows, they're actually appearing as separate objects. So that's, that's a huge challenge. In fact, that's one of the open areas, which is still a lot of researchers are trying to come up with a perfect algorithm which can handle that. And it's, it's worthwhile kind of talking about like what could actually pertain and go into handling shadows. But uh, before I do that, uh, there's, of course, uh, other things to talk about. Uh, any, any ideas, can you suggest like how do we, if you think from the background model perspective, is there some idea which you can think of or guess how exactly can the shadows be handled in a sub situation like this? Well, the movement of the shadow is dependent on the movement of the, the item you're trying to surveil, right? <laughs> so you, you can decouple them and remove <laughs> the one that's dependent. Okay. So decoupling the shadows is fine. Could you do the thermal imaging? Exactly, I was, I was getting to there actually. In fact, uh, the alternative approach to that is doing infrared image. In fact, mm -hmm. that's actually based on thermal imagery, it's based on the temperature, so mm -hmm. the shadows of course will be separate from that. But one hand side of this is it's, it's very expensive in terms of the infrared equipment. If you're trying to do something which is more affordable, which my sort of research looks into, you know, it's very difficult to come up with that. But that's an alternative section. But to, to comment on that, it's, it's very interesting. The shadow problem is an open problem. I'm working on that for years now. Um, one of the ways which you know, I personally have seen and other researchers have come, one of the ways to actually handle that is by kind of using the background model, making it more of a learning data set. If you actually supervise the background data set, kind of train the image or the machine to actually towards shadows or what kind of different shadows can there be, it might work. But uh, one way of without doing supervised learning or machine learning, you can handle that, is by doing texture collection. If you actually look at the neighborhood around the pixels, you know, if you code the image as part of a difference between your neighborhood, then what happens is the shadows as they come on, they actually bring in different intensities. 
But if that is a part of a difference, if the whole model is coded as a difference, then that's one way of negating out the portions which actually go out. So that's one way of handling it. Of course, it's not a perfect way of handling it by any means, but that's one way of dealing with the problem. But that's, again, an open problem. In fact, you know, I would be interested to talk to uh, collaborators or researchers about that because that's an ongoing research topic. So that's just to give you an idea of what kind of things you can get. But the thermal imagery is definitely one way of getting out, but at the same time, it's, it's expensive to do that. So let's go and actually look at uh, some more specific examples. As I said, the talk as it goes on will move, move towards multi power attacking, which is currently my focus of research. So if you see over here, it's again a public place, it's a neighborhood. Now, if you observe very carefully, it's very interesting. There's some things which will come out of this video which is of uh, interest to us. So I want you to observe this one and see if uh, there's something which you notice about that interesting. Again, it's doing target tracking. This is uh, more of a, a scene where you have uh, multiple targets coming in. So any comments about this video? Did, uh, did you, do you find everything was perfect about this? Okay. okay, so some of the images have got two boxes. Good point. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think will that imply? Two boxes, some of the images having together? Two people, okay. So what kind of two people, when you're talking about identifying individual targets, when two people coming in together can actually uh, do to your image? Any sort of complications can they create? See, what if they were exchanging mm -hmm. something? Okay, there was an interaction coming in. So there were two people who actually were kind of interacting, they knew each other, and they were coming close enough. So the proximity space is kind of, could be leading to a problem. So that's actually my next discussion when we talk about multi-target tracking. It's, it's a situation, a very interesting thing. Some of the issues which come with multi-target tracking is some challenges is what is called typically as occlusion. So what you saw over here is a target overlap. You know, one box containing two people together is because of the proximity level. Because if you are tracking someone after taking the person and the person is coming too much close to another person, then there will be an overlap which will partially obscure one of the persons or one of the subjects. So that's one of the challenges which actually is part of multi type of tracking. In fact, another challenge which I'm going to show with this video is interesting. That's uh, the total overlap where you have the whole target hidden. And this video actually will demonstrate that. It's actually focusing on one person. But that's actually two of the major problems or challenges which are in the case of multi type of tracking. And I'll actually take you further as we move on to one way in which the current uh, method or model which I'm proposing as part of my work, which kind of works around this problem, but these are serious problems. The other thing, which is a, a very difficult problem, especially in crowded scenarios, which can get even more crowded in a public place, is to actually find uh, data association. You know, how the tracks, one trajectory, cannot be actually mixed with another trajectory or data from one track is kind of led or tracked throughout the video because remember we're doing this with multiple frames. So just observe this one. This is a video intentionally done with the idea that the person who's being tracked is kind of getting obscured by the person from time to time. So it's showing the challenges in multiple target tracking and how you know, this particular video is performing. So, so what do you think about that? Do you think uh, it's, it's, it's doing a good job? Just curious to hear from the cop. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's typically following the person, but the idea is again, you know, when you're talking about different people coming in, that's probably to highlight the fact that obscuration or target hiding is one of the challenges which typically happen. So if you're going from multi-targets to single target, you might face that problem. Of course, in this video, it was the idea was to just make sure if this person can be actually successfully tracked around because he's probably a subject uh, or a suspect who are interested in and then trying to follow him. So how successfully the camera can do against mm -hmm. all odds in terms of different subjects coming in the way, that's also part of the challenge. So this was more to highlight the obscuration problem. Yes, Steve. Does the box mean that that person is being tracked? Yes. So what do you actually see over here, it's interesting, this particular thing, the, the method we are using over here is actually encoding the subject not as a part of uh, like pixels, but more as a particle filter. So we are actually doing the person as a point trajectory, 
And what you see over here is basically trying to see and show that this is an active status particle filter. But in this one, the camera's moving, right? So yeah. how does the camera not, how does the camera know that some of the things that are in the mm -hmm. background aren't interesting? So what actually, for this one, this video, what has been applied is machine learning, so we've actually trained the background. Uh, so a lot of the videos, and that's where it's interesting, of course, if we talk about the whole background model, that might sound very simplistic. But honestly, the background model, the way you know, the model is, it has come a long way since its first time. You know, there have been situations where it has been trained. And there have been artificial neural networks, for that matter, applied to that. Also, there have been cases of data sets. You know, the whole video, if you have to make a sophisticated intelligent video, it's not just about you know, doing the algorithm, applying it to the footage. You have to do a lot of training before that. So that's basically the data sets. So together with the data sets and the algorithm, that's where you can actually get or achieve the best performance. So the answer to that question would be that it has obviously been trained. Machine learning has been combined with that. So this is kind of just give you an idea of uh, you know, what different scenarios. And, and every single video, the security footage comes to you at different challenges. It's not that every single video has the same sort of challenges. We just talked about some generic portions. But uh, this is. Uh, you know, the three of these are probably the ones which I'm dealing with. And honestly, you know, after years of work, there's no perfect solution to it. We can only suggest certain algorithms come up with new innovative techniques which can take care of one of the problems, but the other problem will remain large. So what I'm actually going and kind of preparing a lead way to my current research which I'm doing is that I found out a, a new way in which you can do target tracking in which you don't have to worry about all these problems because these come in if you're talking about taking the targets as individuals. You know, separate targets, multi-target tracking, you're talking about doing the individual targets. So what is interesting to me is, is more about going towards changing the semantics to the situation. And that is where I actually lead up to group tracking. Because before we go there, let's just see some more videos, I believe. We have one particular thing. So the occlusion problem, if you see over here, this video will give you, you know, a better idea. It's, it's a more crowded scenario. So if you see, it's probably doing a better job than the previous videos in terms of handling the targets. It's supposed to be an occlusion handler. So what do you see as the red boxes, if you observe carefully, you know, it, it's doing some of the object tracking. It, it's trying to avoid the overlap, which is typically very normal in these situations. And again, uh, the performance analysis, you know, uh, I've got some short video footages over here. By no means they are the measure because when we test the system, system algorithms, we have to do it for a longer frame of time. Because we want to make sure we actually build the background model. For example, I'm doing the background model. You have to give it a lot more statistics over the frames in order to be perfect because things might change over time. <coughs> So what do you think about this one? This is actually a very recent uh, algorithm which is published. In fact, I've been playing around with that. It's a different form of the particle filter algorithm where the targets, I mean, what uh, the algorithm is claimed to have done is uh, try to handle occlusion better, a little better than the previous work. Which was there. Any comments? Yeah, false positives are always perfect part of that. But, but more importantly is taking into consideration the fact that when you have the overlap, how well is it actually doing in that situation? Because it's supposed to be an occlusion handler. <coughs> Apart from false positives, any, any other things noticeable? It's separating, <coughs> let's say if someone was stationary, not moving, mm -hmm. it's separating it. Mm -hmm. Let's say versus like a tree or a bike or so the objects, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Identifying that stationary object as a human mm -hmm. and not as a tree or a code. Good point. Now, this particular point, of which, you know, you're talking about the objects over here. It's trying to track everything. Because the fact, this is not unlike <coughs> the video we saw earlier on traffic surveillance. It's not a classifier. So you can actually add more intelligence to this whole scenario. You make this algorithm more sophisticated by adding a classifier. If you train it with a data set like as to what a human figure would be against like an object, for example, like lampposts or trees, it could come out with a better performance. So this algorithm, which you know, I, I try to create this one by applying algorithm, didn't have any classifier data set of that sort. 
It was just using the particle filter with trying to handle the occlusion by separating out the spaces. So it was taking the proximity levels, the distances, and trying to encode them in taking a decision as to which one are targets and which one are not. So it, it's, it's part of the greater research, and what I'm trying to build on is, again, looking at what are different scenarios which can actually pose a challenge. So uh, one of the scenarios which I have been using, you know, this is a, a typical scenario that I said we're talking about public place, you know, people tracking. But my own favorite, if, if you talk about uh, one of the games I really like, and I'm sure a lot of you are sports fans, is soccer. So if you talk about uh, a soccer tracking system, it's, it's a more interesting problem because if you see in the soccer tracking field, you know, if you look at this, it's just a snapshot of uh, a demo video, which you see over here. Again, we could have the same sort of overlapping problem, but here, the greater challenge is not just identifying targets, but trying to do consistent tracking, making sure you can actually kind of track the movement of a certain team of players, or trying to focus on the region of interest, which is where the ball lies in. So in this picture you can actually see that, so it's, it's a more you know, a tough challenge in doing that, but what is more interesting is that if you look at the whole multi-target tracking in terms of the crowd scene, which we've seen so far, it becomes a little bit different when it comes about a soccer, because it's a team game, right? So here we are probably not interested in looking at the individuals as such, but maybe just do an overall team tracking. You know, a team with the white jersey over here it represents a certain team. We're interested to see how they are actually working as a group or as a team. So it's not just about following the ball or just doing a simple target tracking. So it's different from the previous scenario. <coughs> that's what I'm actually currently working on, which kind of gives me to a, a new aspect. So when you're talking about target tracking, multi-target tracking, it's not always about just finding the targets or one certain target or a group of targets as it comes and changes. In a game of soccer, the problem, which is a more of an open problem, is how you can consistently track a whole team of players. So say the white jersey players, when you're talking about that, that could give you a new model, a group model, like this is a team, okay? And the way you know the team is by the jersey color, right? Are there any other features by which you can identify the whole set of players as a team? Which is actually one of the decisions which I'm working on in terms of taking in so apart from color, what exactly are the similarity between a team of players? If you look at this, the snapshot of the field. Which way you're facing? The movement, the motion. If, if they're of the same team, they will have some sort of consistency in movement, right? But of course, apart from that, it's, it's more interesting to also see, you know, <coughs> movement is fine. But what is the situation? This is a you know, simple stick situation, a very simple stick data set. We'll be talking about white and orange colored jerseys. What about if we had uh, the colored jerseys as both white but a different texture? You know, one with black stripes with red stripes. It's not easy to actually differentiate them just based on color stem. You have to take into consideration what is known as, say, the jersey textures. So that's currently a very open and interesting problem. In fact, you know, I would like to hear comments from others. You know, I'm collaborating with researchers as well on this one, but it's a very open problem. So. What actually the idea is that if you take the whole model of multi-target tracking and instead of look at it as more as a group tracking, you know, you don't have to worry about individual targets, but you can just track a group as a whole. And I'm going to give you a demo video of what exactly that would look like when in terms of tracking, but the idea of, you know, doing the individual targets is probably an idea which is kind of becoming more difficult in terms of all these problems we talked about. So I'm kind of evading and moving on to the next level with that. So let me actually show you the idea of a group semantic. So if you see this video over here, this is just showing a bunch of you know, people jogging and doing exercise together. Now if you observe it, you know, it's a very complex motion. The whole motion you know, has overlap and stuff like that. So it, it's very difficult, you know, whatever perfect algorithm you come up with to still do the multi-target tracking successfully. Because of the nature of the motion, if you see the way they're doing, and then we, you will find that there is another person who will be joining them soon. So if you see the whole semantics of the scene, if you were to actually look at this whole picture, and again, you see the way they are actually moving, it's, it's very difficult to do a perfect multi-target tracking on this sort of a situation, given the complexity of the situation. So it's probably easier to actually come to the conclusion if the camera was to actually look at this picture and say, ah, it's not like three different individuals or four different individuals, it's actually a group of people. 
who have similarity in terms of motion, they have some sort of correlation. They're actually working with each other. They're working out with each other. They're running with each other. So it's probably easier to actually identify that and come up with a group semantics model. And that's what I'm actually trying to move to. That's what I'm currently working on. So let me show you one of the things, what will happen if we were to put in group semantics onto a normal surveillance video. So what you see actually next is going to be interesting because this is a neighborhood video. If you watch very carefully, there are going to be situations where there are individuals over here, but there are going to be groups as well. So I want you to just observe this one and see what you actually think about that. So now if you notice over here, there's actually a bunch of people coming in. And they're no longer being actually boxed separately. So they're actually being followed the camera as a group. So my research results over here, and again, it's, it's still a work in progress, they say. I suggested that instead of doing the boxes, since if it's there in close proximity, we can take off all these components of you know, the data obscuration, the overlap, if we identify them more as a group. And we can still let the individual targets who are not part, automatically not a group, like car or the individual walking here and there, as separate going on <coughs> in the monitoring. So what do you think about that? Comments? And this is a very new area. You know, it, it's something which researchers have just started touching on a little bit. You know, I have my own algorithms which I'm doing, but of course it's important when you talk about a group, the obvious question is what do you mean by group? And that's where actually the problem lies. So how do you model your group? You know, my group over here, if you look at this picture in this case, is modeled based on the proximity, right? The motion. But again, in the soccer problem, it could be different. It could be the color, the jersey colors itself. So it's, it's very interesting if you do want to make intelligent surveillance, the camera more intelligent, if you can make the camera understand what we understand when we see things as a group, then it becomes actually a different level of intelligence altogether. And that's where my actually research is pertaining towards. And, and that's, I find, a more interesting problem. Let me actually hear comments. Um, I, it's fairly easy to pick out a group when they're by themselves <laughs> walking down a sidewalk. Um, are you doing work, or is there work being done trying to identify the group amongst the crowd? Yes, so, that's, that's so you, definitely there. So you picture the, the stereotypical mm -hmm. New York City street, mm -hmm. right? You've got the, the entire mass of humanity moving down. Mm -hmm. How do you identify this family as a group out of this mass of people? Good question over there. They're, they're actually being worked down over here, but it will be very difficult. And again, the idea is what do you actually identify as a group? So what you describe as a family, do they have certain characteristics in common? Because it's, it's very hard to define for the camera unless you feed it with the data as to what a family is like. So if the family has something in common, like if they're waking something outfit-wise, which is common, they have a certain you know, motion, the direction of the motion is consistent. So based on those features and factors, we can come to a conclusion. So what I'm trying to create is a more generic model where you can actually take up different features, you put them together, and depending on the situation, you can actually apply that to a situation. So like a soccer team situation would be different from like this sort of a neighborhood surveillance. So here you're expecting more like a group of people based on their proximity levels, their motion, whereas in the soccer field, there will be a more different challenge of tracking you know, people with the same colors as far as the teams goes. Uh, there could be the ball also in the picture. So it, it's a different problem, different every scenario. So what actually I'm coming up with, and, and it's more of a framework, is that if we kind of pick up a set of features, whether it's color, texture, motion, and combine them together and give them certain rating or weightage, you know, depending on the problem, we can actually train our surveillance to be more adaptive to the situation. Yes, Steve? Are you actually a soccer fan? I am. So when you watch mm -hmm. soccer, the coverage that you get is entirely dependent on the teams that you're watching. So if you're watching uh, 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 an Italian league game between Palermo and Sicily, mm -hmm. well, not Sicily, Palermo and, uh, say, uh, AC Milan, AC Milan. that's going to be a completely different coverage than what you'll see if you're watching English Premier League, which mm -hmm. is completely different than if you're watching the Champions League mm -hmm. championship game. Right? right. 
But if you're watching the Champions League championship game, they will, they will have statistics in there. That, that baffles my mind. I wonder how they actually do it. And I have a couple of guesses, but maybe you have more informed guesses than mine. If you're watching that game, they will tell you the exact distance that each player has run. They'll say, okay, Wayne Rooney has run 11.65 kilometers. Exactly. Are they, do they have people watching the game and tracking them? With there the are actually a certain commercial software out there. It's actually a good question to ask. You know, I've done some research on that. There's actually some software. I can give you some names over there. You can actually look them over. There's a software which is called eAssistant, which actually collects statistics over these games. It's a very sophisticated system. But the way they do it is that they do it multi-target tracking. They use a very sophisticated algorithm version of that. They don't track things as a group or trying to identify a group semantics. So what they do is they track the team or the players more as individuals. They're trying to follow the main focus of the game for the ball, but they do try <coughs> to calculate uh, the distances. In fact, one of the ways they actually, I, I saw one of the papers I read, they do it is by also doing some basic RFID stuff. So they might have a transmitter or a receiver mm -hmm. fit there, which gives you the data, which is a very easy way of actually doing that. That can be done. But there are software out of their commercial versions, which actually are covering the entire stadium. In fact, uh, the stadium, the way they sometimes do it is by doing a 3D model. They will do a field model, and they will take in the players more as, map them as points. Mm -hmm. And they will try to get the distance or aerial view wise and, and try to compete the proximity. That's how you actually get to line up with, uh, but the velocity, I think they will definitely be doing it with transmitters or receivers down there. So yeah, there are systems out there, but their approach mainly is towards you know, target tracking, individual. Whereas my approach, what I'm talking about, is actually getting over that, doing more consistent tracking as a group. So instead of doing the ball watching or the player tracking, if I can do the entire team tracking you know, with statistics, that will be a more intelligent model. So that's where the recent research is going. Yes, sir. Um, Let's say a, a soccer team were to hire you to do this kind of team tracking. Mm -hmm. What would you hope to teach them or use to improve their performance? Well, my motivation would be if I were to hire, I mean, of course, it's a work in progress. I have to show results for that. <laughs> but uh, that the fact goal? is that my, my goal would be to look at the whole performance. So if you look at multi-target tracking, it's a very sophisticated and a complicated algorithm. So the more you have more sophistication in it, it becomes more in terms of performance. So as a researcher, if you ask me, my goal has always been real-time performance delivery. So it's very hard to do a real-time performance if you're talking about so many factors. You know, the occlusion, the overlap, the obscuration, data association. It's much easier if you, the way I was doing in the earlier video I showed, it's a very simple video. If I can just draw the circles with the group, that will become more easier. So my goal would be, what I would have to offer to them is to actually give them a more real-time performance, response time-wise, which is simplistic in terms of model. So group tracking, very new area, very open area. So uh, if you're interested more about it, you know, as I said, you know, I'm open to collaboration and research. It's something which I'm working very passionately on. But uh, it's something worthwhile looking at, given the way the directions on multi-target tracking has gone over the years. And this is just a semblance. As I said, it's a work in progress. So before we actually end, I wanted to show you some more examples as far as demos go. So, uh, in terms of some of the other things which I'm doing, intelligent service models, I believe I actually done a talk on the, on the privacy cam. So the privacy cam actually uh, is based on a model of a recent problem. It's a global problem where we are talking about privacy invasion happening in cameras or videos. So the security footages which are captured in public places, malls, you know, airport security systems, they in a way are kind of invading your privacy because you are being captured, recorded without actually being having consent. So there's a, a huge lobby, a debate going on this problem. So one of the open areas is how you can actually model privacy when it comes to all these uh, surveillance cameras or, or systems. Because one of the statistics which has been seen, it's an interesting thing that surveillance cameras are not quite effective, if you look at the statistics, in terms of stopping or putting a, a whole stop to crime. I mean, they are effective and handy to have but they are kind of driving the crime out of the camera bounds towards areas which are less kind of populated or kind of monitored. So uh, one of my works which I did earlier was privacy cam and uh, if you're interested, I'll have the reference paper there as well. Uh, it's, it's a good model, you know, one of the ways I tackled it is by looking at the whole pictures, what you see over here is from my work, is by encrypting the entire individual. So if I apply a background subtraction model, you know, identify the change, the person in interest, I can just encrypt the entire portion in there. <laughs> of 
course, I've applied some morphing techniques <coughs> to get a smooth, you know, slough it over here in terms of the borders. But if you just do a simple block also, that takes out the whole person, you know, out of the frame. So you can still observe that there is something going on over here which is fishy, like the loitering over here or the fighting to individuals without having to know the identity of the persons. So uh, if you do apply applied cryptography to this, that's one way of solving the privacy problem in which you can actually you know, encrypt the image, decrypt it if there's actually some sort of a real crime scenario where of course the key becomes important, but this is again part of an ongoing research, you know, how to make this more sophisticated. But this is again a part of an intelligent surveillance system. If you can make surveillance systems sensitive to the issue of privacy, nothing like that. And the other thing which is a application to that is uh, racial discrimination. If you talk about racial discrimination which are happening worldwide, it's a very global problem especially in airport security systems, if you talk about people being randomly you know, taken up for racial discrimination, which is, might be, it's, it's an arguable term, but if we do take out the person from the equation, you know, added to the person, we can say that there's no reason for racial discrimination to come in, especially when it comes to security systems. So that's an extended application, which is also a part of the kind of intelligence it is. The other thing which is a very interesting part of research, again, open part of research, I'm talking about uh, future scope <coughs> as well as how you actually come up with a trust model. So a lot of times when we talk about these security footages, we are, we are basing on the basic assumption that they are trustworthy. You know? How do you actually attribute to say, okay, this video or what the work this is doing in the detection system is trustworthy? So how do you accumulate or attribute towards the trust? So coming up with a trust model that's interesting, there have been a number of works that have been done over here. Some people have suggested that uh, factors like you know, taking certain features of individual identity of the target out of there kind of brings it more towards the trust model, but that's an open area. Just like the group model I talked about, trust <coughs> model can also be formulated based on the situation. And that's what researchers around the world are also working on. And finally, the other area which is probably you know, promising at the same time, but something which I would like to work upon, I haven't actually touched too much on it, but I've seen some examples, it's worth mentioning over here is, if we do combine audio along with video, so whatever the work I've done so far is video surveillance, but if we do have audio along with that, that probably kind of might enhance the whole modeling of trust, or say for that matter, privacy. I mean, you can actually combine both of them to come up with the best of both worlds. Now, there has been work done on audio surveillance, which of course is not exactly my area, but it's interesting that if I do manage to bring in audio into the equation, I might get some more interesting results as far as things go. But these are some of the areas which are very open. In fact, uh, there are things which uh, can be worked on them. And uh, uh, very, very interesting problems. If you look at uh, the kind of global issues we have over here, uh, different researchers have different ways of looking at the problem, but uh, everything uh, is kind of interesting as it sums up over here. So yeah, this is just uh, from the privacy cam work. Actually, I did as part of my uh, dissertation, you know, some images captured from that. And uh, we got some good results. At the same time, we got some, you know, mixed feedbacks on that. So uh, one of the things which we actually were kind of posed with as a question or a concern was that how do we handle uh, something like a cryptographic key? The important thing is that when you're doing an encryption, the key for the encryption, which is basically how you're actually hiding the blocks, how do you handle that? So because if the key, the whole technology over here, the privacy cam, it's an, in fact, it's a patent patenting technology. Uh, the patent idea behind the key is that if the key is compromised, your technology is compromised. So how do you handle that key is interesting. That's in fact part of my side researches. Uh, some <coughs> of the things which I found out is that uh, using something which is very simple, like having a single key, might not be the best way of going about it. We'll have to have a multiple combination of keys where you know, one key would be with one person so that even if one is com compromised somehow, it's not gonna be actually affecting because without <coughs> both the keys or multiple keys, you cannot unlock the image. So a lot of these things are, are interesting and uh, uh, right now, of course, as I said, my focus is more towards the group tracking because that's uh, something which is more interesting in terms of uh, performance-wise and most of the systems that you saw the demo uh, one of my targets has been to come up with real-time performance. That means performance which can be done in a matter of just a fraction of seconds because sometimes it's, it's very important because if you talk about the real world, there's no people actually waiting there for, you know, just to get the best results and, and willing to wait there. They want the results real-time 
because they have to attend to the situations, whether it's a crime scenario or any other situation. So uh, there's kind of a compromise, it's a trade-off. If you want to put in more stuff like uh, training or machine learning that might actually uh, load up your whole algorithm, make it more slow, but at the same time, if you apply something like a background model, it becomes more simplistic, worthwhile doing in real time, but there are certain always uh, you know, pros and cons to that. So coming up with the best of both worlds, of course, is a part of uh, ongoing research. So on that note, uh, kind of uh, coming on to the end of the talk, uh, just uh, a few references. If anyone is interested, I have the demo videos done over here from OpenCV. Let me take some questions here. Yes. Um, it's kind of unrelated to group tracking, but how do you deal with outdoor surveillance cameras and weather like snow and rain? And That's actually part of what I was talking about, the elements. So the background, typically, if you have those elements, like uh, it could be rain, snow. In fact, one of the things which has been going on also is, is very difficult to do is night vision. If you talk about the night time, if you're looking at you know, headlights of a car, it's very hard to figure out. So the best methods so far which have come out is in terms of data sets, if you apply machine learning to them. So in addition to the background model, if you apply data learning to them, you can make and train the system. Of course, if you're training, a particular substitute forget it because it's different from every single video from the other. You have to do the training on the specific video, but that requires a lot of frames and time. So that's the you know uh, trade-off on that. But if you do that, you might be able to get over the problem. The other, of course, option is to do thermal imagery, mm -hmm. which is, is probably more sophisticated, but it, it's expensive at the same time. You know, so there's always trade-offs and compromise that's going on. But that's one of the things. But it's a good question because that's part of also ongoing research how we can handle that problem. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, have you ever heard of blocking behavior? Like, there's just general pattern that people follow mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, I'm wondering, is, has there been like any research done? Uh, just kind of like. So, did I hear right? You said blocking behavior. Blocking, yeah. yeah, that's actually what I've been doing as part of that. It's, it's like you know what I describe it. It's called typically a flock of birds problem. So there have been some research which have been done on a flock of birds, like trying to analyze them in a 3D model, but mainly my research has been in 2D. So you know, what I'm trying to do is my group model will also help in tracking the birds, because if you look at the birds, the way they move, there is some sort of consistency in their pattern. So part of my work you know, going towards that is also pattern recognition. So the group model which I can form with the birds is their motion. You know, Similarity in characteristics, maybe the whole uh, you know motion flow around the neighborhood, because they are traveling in a flock, so there will always be some birds around each other. So if you look at that pattern and take that into the picture, the neighborhood pattern or modeling that that also comes into handy. So that's also part of the group modeling. That's a good question. Yes. When you say you're training the system to recognize a background or training it somehow, mm -hmm. more specifically, what are you doing? It's specific towards like the security footage, the frames. So say I start with the first frame when I start capturing the footage. You know, starting from the first frame, say I, I take up a point like 100 frames. That gives me like, more or less, I mean, it's no way, you know, you're talking about the whole footage like which is hours long video. Gives me a little bit of an idea of what actually happened in those 100 frames. And I actually, actually take them and create the statistics, the features from them to create an overall model. So the way it's actually done, there are different ways of doing it to be more specific to your question. You know, I could take in the different pixels in the picture mm -hmm. and just look at their overall patterns over the time, like the 100 frames, mm -hmm. and feed that into my data set. So I could actually come up with like a collection of state vectors or memory collection. I could create an array, actually, for that matter, and, and put in all those statistics. If you're looking at the color, you know, the motion of the person, so all of these could be based on the features. So typically, the data set actually is, is done that way. The other thing which is very popular amongst the world is that if you have a very powerful, exhaustive data set, especially a classification problem where you're trying to identify an object or a vehicle as a car, you know, based on those pictures from those data sets existing, you can do classifier, you can train, which is part of the machine learning thing I was talking about. Okay. Um, how automatable is that process? I mean, obviously not tremendously, but... <laughs> how it's... It, it has been integrated successfully in a lot of powerful systems. In fact, uh, the kind of some of the systems that you saw has that already in built into it. Um, well, again, the fact is that it is possible to do it, but doesn't quite contribute to real-time performance. It, it takes time. Mm -hmm. But again, there have been researches which has been dying how optimized way that can be done. Uh, sometimes it has been found that if you do like a database, a simple query on the data set, it, 
it's based on how good the query is, you know, how mm -hmm. successful you're getting the results in minimal possible time. So in other words, if you're doing uh, machine learning, it's always comes down to, in a lot of senses, to how quickly you can find the match. Okay. So the match templates are in plot, the data set over there. And uh, I guess, kind of taking up the questions, but how sure. important is um, optimizing the program? Just, I mean, because mm -hmm. how much can be handled just by throwing it into a more powerful computer, and how much? Well, good question. Optimizing is very important. Uh, I have worked personally in embedded systems, where you're talking about not just the typical camera or the machine doing that, you know, you're talking about just putting them to a chip where you have much less resources of memory. So optimization becomes very important. Personally, I've worked in you know, real-time operating systems where you can do the things, model them in a way where time, again, the real-time performance is more important. And that's the reason why I said, you know, my research has been more focused towards the simplistic algorithms because I would never be able to do something like, you know, machine learning in that sort of real time. Mm -hmm. So you have to do a compromise in any sense. And that's where you're trying to find out always the best of both worlds, how to combine and still make the system effective. Yes. So, um, <coughs> how, how much work has gone into being able to track an individual person as they go through a crowd? Obviously a lot of work. In fact, uh, uh, what I showed you are, are some very popular data sets. So different algorithms have been applied to that. There's been a lot of work done on that. Especially on the idea of multi-target tracking, like individual targets, but not a whole lot in group tracking. But that's a very new area. So, uh, uh, you know, some algorithms have been very successful, like the ones I showed you. This is from actually uh, the recent results in published in conference algorithms, which I've applied to. In fact, it's interesting to know that uh, this is the Privacy Camp paper, which I published in 2007. A very classical example of, uh, you know, intelligent surveillance, if you are interested in it. But just to let you know, uh, for those, if, if you want to learn and play around a little bit with surveillance stuff, there's a very simple system, Intel OpenCV. Intel has this... Uh, whole tool open source library where you can just pick up small demo videos and that's how you know I've written some small codes to actually work on the data sets and do the demo so it's very easy to start on in fact it doesn't require a whole lot of programming also it's, it's more like a MATLAB and it's actually very much workable with MATLAB and other packages in fact they are very much uh, you know, supportive to the system the other thing is if you want to start off this is a very good book it's actually open uh, source book which you can download from the internet it's written by Gary Bradsky and Adrian Keller. Both of them are, are experts in, in, in video surveillance. It's talking about more of the framework, but they actually get you started with some basics on computer vision and the whole system of pattern recognition, how to do a simple background model as well. So it's, it's a good area to start from uh, overall. So yeah, some of the <coughs> things which uh, over here you can get started. It, it's, it's fun once you start playing around with them, but how you design algorithms, that's where uh, you, know, you face the challenges I was talking about and you, you figure out ways to come out of the challenge. Is and, it going uh, to stop there? Yep, I guess. Thank you. Thank you.